The following segments are pre-recorded and sponsored by Longworth Productions. A new birthing center on Try It Today. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Try It Today, coming to you once again from the beautiful Senior Botanical Garden in Kernersville. We'll tell you more about them later on and later on is when the round table shows up and we'll get into Lord knows all sorts of controversies with those guys, so stay tuned for that. Between now and then, some great guests and important information coming your way. None more important than this topic, and this is where I want to start. We're going to talk about a new birthing center with our special guest, first time visitor with us, Dr. Natalie Rochester's OBGYN with Novant Health Woman Care in Kernersville. Good to see you, Doc. Thank you, sir. Likewise. Um, now, later this month, Novant Health is opening a new birth center at Kernersville Medical Center. So what can pregnant ladies and prospective moms expect to see and experience at this new center? Sort of give us an idea. Sure, our new birth center is a brand new model to the area when it comes to labor and delivery. And what that means is we have something called an LDRP. And that means our moms labor, deliver and recover and spend their postpartum time in a, a larger family size room. Those rooms are equipped to provide comforts to dad um, babies can stay in the rooms with mom, and so we keep moms and babies together throughout their hospital stay. Yeah, because the traditional way was, you know, you're separated from the baby, yep. the, uh, certain family members can't come in to see you, yep. you have different staff running in and out all the time, yep. but this is, this is a new concept. This is more of a family model. It, it's not a new concept, but it's a new concept to our area, um, and it really focuses on providing care for the family and, and keeping the birth experience more as a family and keeping that family unit together. Um, moms will have a nurse that stays with them throughout the, the time, whether they're in labor or have delivered or, or postpartum, right. um, and baby nurses as well. And so there's some continuity in the team that takes care of you, um, but it's also an environment that feels a lot more like home. So it, it provides a, a need that our community needs. Yeah, and less stressful for the, the mom and the family, I Absolutely. would imagine, too, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, Just yes. to know you've got that continuity going and the same faces are looking at you. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, what, let me veer off into a personal thing for a second. What brought you to this area and to Kernersville Medical Center specifically? Well, it's been a very winding road to get here, but um, long story short, I'm a North Carolina native, um, was born and raised in eastern North Carolina, um, I trained at East Carolina, did my residency in Roanoke, Virginia, and my husband and I moved to Colorado and spent almost 10 years there. Where did you meet your husband? Um, we actually were set up on a blind date when I was in college. Wow. In Raleigh, North Carolina. So yeah, we jokingly kind say... Of kind of reckless for a doctor, isn't we, it? We jokingly say that was the last blind date we will ever go <laughs> on, so yeah. But, um, did somebody tell me that you trained in robotics? I did train in robotics. What, now, what is that about? So, the robot is a tool that we use to do laparoscopic surgery. Um, one example is a complicated hysterectomy, but the robot tool allows us to have um, four hands instead of two. And so, we're able to use the robot to improve manipulation of tissue and improve angles and safety when we're doing complicated GYN surgery. And is, now, is the recovery time less? Is it less invasive or what? I mean, what's... So it is less invasive when compared to needing an open incision or an open abdominal wound, yes. Right. Yes. What, uh, who or, very quickly, who or what led you to a career in healthcare and medicine? Did, was there somebody in your family that was a doctor or a nurse or what? So. Absolutely no medical professionals in my family. Um, my mom says jokingly I came out wanting to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> I would say that the person that gave me the bug for obstetrics would be my grandfather who was a dairy farmer. Um, so my first delivery experience, my birth, first birth experience was actually on his farm. I was about 10 years old and um, there was a twin set of calves and the second calf was not delivering easily and I watched as he helped that, that cow deliver. And wow. So yeah, I think that's when the, the initial bug for obstetrics um, was caught, but I've always played doctor as a small child. Well, I, I played a doctor lot of too, when I, that's a whole nother, we're not gonna get into that. Uh, so anyway, very quickly, before time runs out, sure. you're excited about this birth center, aren't you? I'm very excited. I'm excited to have a opportunity for our low risk obstetric moms close to home. That's great. Up on screen, novothealth.org is the general website, and I believe you can call for Novot Health Woman Care. There's a 765-5470 number. It's a good general number to call for that. 
Dr. Rochester, will you come back and see us sometime? Absolutely. If you would have me, I would be happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back after this. The world's brightest are Fulbrights, Goldwaters, McNairs, and Spartans. Prestigious doesn't have to be expensive. And we know you will make a difference wherever you go. UNCG, find your way here. Back now on Try Today, time to visit with someone who's a first time visitor to the show. We're so glad he's here. Gary Canapino is manager of community relations for the city of Greensboro. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And as we sit here in the Senior Botanical Garden, you tell me before we started that your parents live just down the street. So they do. hello to them. <laughs> and what are your mom and dad's first names? John and Olive. John and Olive. Yes. Okay. Good to see you. Your son is right here. Um, all right. Now, what is the purpose? of the community relations office because sometimes people will interchange and mix up terms and mm -hmm. oh here's marketing here's communication here's helping the public uh, talk about it so community relations really is kind of what it sounds like uh, we operate as a liaison for residents and visitors to the city of greensboro um, and the to the city council and the city manager's office they're very busy people there's only nine city council members right and there are 300,000 Greensboro residents more visitors so they can't give everybody the you know time and attention that yeah. they might ask for so we step in in that area so that way uh, we're sort of a conduit for the residents and the public to the people who make the decisions running the city of Greensboro. Right, so I mean, the, so how do you think residents benefit from what you're doing? I mean, obviously there's a, a factor of wanting to give them service and make sure they're taken care of, but how do you assess the relationship you have with the public? Well, I think uh, the main way is um, we, we can be the way that the residents' voices are heard. Um, it's possible that um, sometimes a resident doesn't know how to contact the city council or what right. the city council can do for them. Right. That's where we can step in. So we can either direct them to where they need to be or we can advise them on how to get the services they might need. Yeah, and really, uh, not to belabor this point, but really important that you're giving quality service in that because it, it, everything is important. Each person feels that his or her thing is the most important problem at that time. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, and that ranges from anything from we've had uh, something as simple as, hey, my trash pickup has been missed, to people um, getting ready to experience homelessness. And they don't know where to turn. They turn to the city. And a lot of times we are the people that they first talk. So some things routine and some things actually in crisis mode for these folks. Absolutely. And then you can sort of act as an ombudsman to try to get the, especially people in crisis mode, to make sure, and what do you do? Point them to, okay, here's a food bank, here's a control ministry or whatever? Sure, a lot of times there are things that the city itself can do, depending on what the issue is. Right. Sometimes the city just doesn't cover whatever their problem is. In those cases, then, like you said, we can point them towards the resources that can help them. And sometimes they had no idea those resources existed. A lot of people, like they, they, they'll go to public meetings mm -hmm. and try to air grievances or ask questions or whatever. Now, how many public meetings does your team coordinate, just to give folks an idea? So um, coordinating on our own is actually more rare than you think. Usually what we're doing is we're collaborating with other city departments or the city council members or you know, initiatives of that nature. But on average, we participate in around 50 meetings a year. So we're averaging about one a week. Yeah, you know, I, I guess since you and I've never met before, I wanna ask you something personal. Sure. And that is in the position that you hold, the work that you and your team are doing, uh, what's gratifying to you about what you're doing? Well, I will tell you, one of the main things, probably my personal favorite position, uh, part of my position is a program that the city runs called the City Academy. So what that is, it's a uh, once weekly program for about three months in the fall, where we invite about 30 residents to see different aspects of uh, city operations, city workers. So each week we bring them to a different location and the workers there show them what they do. So these are the people who pick up your trash, pave the streets, you know, clean the water. 
and a lot of times uh, the residents who come in had no idea that all these things were going on in the background, um, basically to make their lives better every day. Right. And I get gratification from seeing those staffers whose work often goes unnoticed. Yeah. I like seeing them get the credit they deserve because the work they do is hard and it's important. And a lot of times it's not known. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I really appreciate that. Look, I'm up on screen, uh, greensboro-nc.gov is the general website, which I hope you will check out. Gary, I hope you'll come back and see us sometime. I appreciate all the work you're doing, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and say hello to your parents. I will. <laughs> all right, we'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth, reminding you that Try It Today is now streaming on WFMY Plus, available free on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Back now on Try It Today, just about time to spend some time with our good friends from Duke Energy, and they have a lot of energy. These guys always, they come over here. I know it's a bad pun, but they do. Next to me, I'm a good buddy, Hank Henning, who is manager of local government community relations for Duke Energy. And Hank's special guest is Bill Norton, who's a principal communications manager. Welcome, guys. Good to see you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Hank, let me start with you. Now, you know, Duke Energy always seems to be looking for ways to improve and update facilities. We've talked about that before and, with, you know, with an eye toward benefiting customers. So I guess what I want to know is what's going on these days and why did you bring Bill along? Well, that's a great question. So, as you know, everything we do is focused on serving our customers and our communities. And when it comes to the power plants we depend on, there's a very complex long range planning process that takes place and Bill's the perfect person to get into that and explain it in more detail. All right, a lot of people when you, when you say, uh, let's talk about a long range plan, they go, uh oh, wait a minute, I don't wanna get into the details there. You don't talk over my head, just give me the basics. What's in this long range plan and how's it gonna help me? So this is our, it's, we call it our Carolina's resource plan because it's actually a dual state system. It's North Carolina and South Carolina together. Okay. Um, but North Carolina, we have to hit carbon neutrality, uh, no carbon emissions by 2050. That's a state mandated goal. So this is the long range plan for how we're gonna get there. By protecting reliability and affordability uh, while getting cleaner at the same time. So that's the, the gist of the, the, the plan. I'll give you an example here in the triad, Stokes County, just north of here, we have the, the Belews Creek coal plant. Right. It's been, been powering the community for, for generations. We're now looking at bringing advanced nuclear to replace that facility. Uh, it's, it's cleaner, there are no emissions. Uh, it would allow uh, Belews Creek to ultimately retire, but we need that new generation in place before we retire the coal plant. So that's what the long range plan is about. We filed that with regulators back in August. They're gonna have public hearings across the state in April and they will ultimately make the decision uh, by the end of the year on the long range plan. If they make the decision by the end of the year, then how do you determine what the status of your plan is if they say, yeah, green light, everything looks good, Bill, then, I mean, when do we start seeing things happen? Well, you know, things are already happening. It's, it's interesting, this, this plan is updated every two years, so it's, it's almost a perpetually ongoing process. So we're always adapting. We're, right now we're carrying out the plan that they authorized two years ago, um, and we've evolved it since then to accommodate North Carolina's incredible uh, growth trajectory. Yeah, I was getting ready to ask you about growth because Hank and, and our buddy Jimmy Flythe too have talked many times before about how are we gonna handle the growth, and it could be how are we gonna handle you know, more electric vehicles, how are we gonna handle, you know, so that falls back onto you to just sort of expand a little bit on what you just brought up, which is how is all this and the plan and what you're talking about gonna have an eye on growth? You know, it, it's, it's a great challenge. I mean, what we are, the growth rate we're looking at, it, it's historic in both size and, and speed. Uh, if you looked at what we filed two years ago, we're now projecting eight times that level of growth uh, wow. by 2030. It's, it's a good challenge, uh, but most of it's from manufacturing, uh, from technology companies, that's about half of it. Population growth and EVs are the other half. Yeah, and businesses moving into, and industries moving in here yep. and you know coming to the airport complex or out in Randolph or wherever. Yep. Yeah, I get that. Hank, before we lose all the time here, how are all these things we've been talking about, the plans and everything, how does that benefit customers overall? Well, Advanced Nuclear Blues is, is really exciting for two, for two reasons. Number one, 
it brings high paying jobs to, to the project, both the temporary construction jobs and the long term permanent employees. But going back to what Bill was talking about with the economic development growth, employers are looking for clean, reliable, affordable energy. And we're the fastest growing state in the country. And it's just a great marketing piece for us because they're going to have dependable energy down the road. Yeah, what you guys are doing are actually helping to try to recruit those industries, and then they bring jobs in too. Right. So it's it's working on all levels. Up on screen, duke-energy.com is the general website, which I hope you will visit. And to Hank and to Bill, I appreciate all you guys are doing, and keep me posted, will you? We'll do. We'll do. Thank right. you. We'll be right back after this. North Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge, providing even more electricity that's cleaner, reliable, and that stays affordable. We're getting out of coal and reinvesting in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that North Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Back now on Try It Today, and uh, if we were ever going to be accused of being provincial on this show, boy, are we provincial right now, because just down the street is Corners Folly from Senior Botanical Garden. So we thought, well, let's get somebody in to tell us about Corners Folly and much more that's going on. With me now is Susanna rich Mallet. She's Executive Director of Corners Folly. Welcome. Thank you. Now, for folks who don't know, who maybe have just moved into the area or they live outside the area, what is Corners Folly? Where is it located? And are you open year round? Give us some basics. Sure. Corners Folly is a very unique historic house that was built by a man named Jewel Kerner in 1880. And it was constructed to be his base of operations for his new interior design business. Okay. So it's now a historic house museum. We are open year round for self-guided tours. We offer guided tours and programming for children, families, adults, and the community. And the house itself is hard to describe yeah, with words. Yeah, I was gonna ask you. It was originally designed with only 11 rooms and a central open carriageway. So that was when Jewel was a bachelor. Later in life, he married and his family grew. They had two children and the house transformed from 11 rooms to 22 rooms, which created wow. a very maze-like floor plan. Did he not realize that the more kids you had, the more rooms you have to add? <laughs> he must have realized that he needed to do something. Yeah, so. well, he did something, that's for sure. He now, did. What, now, why does, why does Corners Folly bring so many people to this area? I think that people are interested in this particular period of American history. Um, we're talking about, you know, the house was constructed in 1880. It was lived in full time by the family until the mid 1920s. It was a time of great change in America. There was a lot going on. There were many new technologies available. Um, the tobacco industry, the textile industry, the furniture industry in North Carolina, they all had an impact on how Kerner's Folly was shaped and formed. All right, now uh, you sent me an email one day and said there's something really big going on on April 1st. Tell me about it. We are thrilled to host a grand opening celebration for the new John and Bobby Wolf Visitor Center which is um, a big extension of our campus in partnership with the town of Kernersville. How is that going to help or impact uh, the town of Kernersville and the area around it to have that, that uh, visitor center? We believe it will have a very positive impact, both on the Kerners Folly experience. So we've upgraded a lot of our facilities, um, including a paved parking lot, improved um, programming space that is accessible to all people. So once, uh, once it's open, I can go in there and find out what's going on around in Kernersville and, and, and the area. And so it's, it's sort of a good place to start, right? 
It's a wonderful place to start for people traveling from out of town who are coming to Kernersville, to the Piedmont Triad, and looking for a lot of fun things to do, and not just Kerner's Folly, but of course we'll be happy to share information about that too. All right, before time gets away, I just want, I want to ask you, is there anything coming up you want to mention that, uh, that's, that's going on or might happen at, at Kerner's Folly that we want to look forward to? Sure. As part of our opening on April 1st, we'll be hosting our first free admission community day. So that's going to kick off at 11 a.m. Plus this spring, we're looking forward to our sixth annual spring vintage market, which is Saturday, April 20th, starting at 9 a.m. Vintage market. Okay. I'm vintage, so I guess I should go. You're invited. All right. So up on screen, kernersfolly.org is the general website, which I hope you will check out for more information. And our thanks to Stephanie Pace Brown and her team at Visit Winston-Salem for suggesting this uh, topic. So you can go to visitwinstonsalem.com for more information about what's going on with tourism and all of that. Susanna, thanks for all you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. I right, will be right back after this. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth, reminding you to catch my column, Longworth at Large, and Yes Weekly, every week. It's available throughout the triad, or you can go online, yesweekly.com. Fly local, fly easy, fly PTI. Spartans are the teachers, artists, nurses, scientists, and leaders who build our communities. Back now on try today, just niece. about, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to do the show. Okay. <laughs> All right, back now, back now on try today, and, uh, mm. and uh, anyway. All right, so it's about time for the round table, but a quick shout out to the good folks at uh, Senior Botanical Garden, and uh, you can do anything out here and even be with Keith. <laughs> All right, uh, on my right, but always political left, Ogie Overman, Dave Briggs, we call Mr. Theater, who's executive director of the High Point Theater. Keith just had a rough time with a eye procedure, so the reason I'm mentioning that is because if he starts blinking, I don't want anybody to think he's winking at me, <laughs> because there's nothing going on between the two of us. All right, guys, uh, the primary has passed. Let's talk about a couple things, a couple runoffs. Addison McDowell and Mark Walker are going to have a runoff on May 14th for the 6th District, which includes most of the triad. Uh, surprised about that, and who wins the runoff, Hoagie? I'm not really surprised. I mean, Trump's endorsement carries so much weight, bad as I hate it, and they cannibalize Mark for saying a few disparaging words against Trump, and he spoke the truth. Yeah. So I think he'll he'll draw from the rest of them, and I hope he beats that who, who do you think, who do you, who do you, you think that Castelli and Hines and some of them will come over and support Mark? I do, do yeah, I think they will. Dave. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Mark Walker is going to win this one just from name recognition. Uh, Addison McDowell is, is pretty young. Um, I'm, I was really disappointed in the, the results with, with Costelli because I don't think he did a very good ground game. But uh, it should have probably been Walker and Costelli in a runoff. All right, than McDowell. Key. Walker's going to win it. You think so? No Absolutely. problem. No problem. Who's he going to draw from? He's going to draw from the other candidates that dropped out. All right, uh, and uh, just very quickly, the lieutenant governor race, I mentioned that because uh, Forsyth, Winston-Salem uh, DA, Jim uh, uh, O'Neill, is running uh, in a runoff with Hal Weatherman on May 14th for the Republican uh, side of things. Who wins that one, Ogie, quickly? I think Weatherman is less Trumpy than that O'Neill guy, so I, I hope he wins. Dave? Yeah, I think Weatherman's probably the better candidate here. Uh, I like Jim O'Neill fine. He's done a great job in Forsyth County. Right, Key. I kind of think Jim O'Neill is going to win. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, we'll see I what happens. And, and, and whoever wins that, by the way, will face Rachel Hunt, who is the daughter of former Governor Jim Hunt. All that's right. going to be a tough one. Speaking of Congress, North Dakota voters will go to the polls in June to decide if there should be age limits on members of Congress. Now, guys, we talked about term limits before. But would you like to see a maximum age limit for members of Congress, Ogie? No, I really wouldn't. It's too many variables. I, I, I'm for term limits. I think six terms is fine for the House. Term limits, but not I age really limits. I really do, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, I like term limits as well, because you do have people like Chuck Grassley, who is still pretty sharp at 86. All right, Keith, what about age limits for Congress? I think you let the voters vote. 
and, 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 and most of the time these people have people around them who are giving them the information. They're just many times the, the, the lead figurehead, but they, they have policies. So I wouldn't uh, do term limits, I mean age limits. Age limits, okay. Uh, President Biden says grocery stores are ripping off consumers and he wants them to lower prices. The thing is, is it gonna get to the point where he freezes food prices like we've had done with you know, gas prices during hurricanes and things like that. He doesn't want gouging, you know, price gouging. What do you think, should Biden freeze the food prices? I hope he does. There is so, literally so much gouging. I mean, from week to week, you can see gouging going on. And it's, it's crazy. Dave, I hate, what do I hate you to think? say this, but this all started in the first week of his presidency when he shut down all of the uh, uh, oil and gas production. The price of diesel is expensive. If it costs you more money to ship your goods from the farm to the table, then the price of the, at the grocery store is gonna go a up. A ripple effect on that. Keith, would you like to see a, a freeze on food prices? Well, I like to see uh, uh, some disparity on food prices. Like many poor people have to go to these, uh, to these places where the food is not healthy. If you are not rich, you can't go to the Whole Foods and things like that. So there should be some disparity amongst food. All right, Massachusetts educators are asking the governor to send the National Guard into public high schools in order to quell what they say is, quote, shocking levels of chaos and violence. Guys, you think it's okay to use uh, troops to keep our schools safe? Okay. You know, that's such a sad situation, Jim. I mean, that's pitiful. Massachusetts of all places. No, I don't think, I, somehow there's got to be a better solution than sending the National Guard in your schools. And, and they're worried about the whole thing. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting solution. I can't agree with that. Keith? I think you add more police officers uh, in the schools uh, or, or you train people to go in there who can, can handle kids, but not National Guard. That's, that's too much. The uh, state of Connecticut is using COVID-19 rescue uh, funds to uh, uh, erase medical debt for hundreds of thousands of people. Very quickly, guys, yes or no, would you like to see North Carolina do that? Elgin. Yeah, that applies 5% if it's more than, yeah, yeah that applies Dave. to me. I'd yeah, I love think to if, see I it. think if those funds are still in the coffers, they should be used for e. something. Absolutely. Like All right. All right, finally, a Pew Research poll says that 80% of women take the last name of their husband, while only 8% of men take the last name of their wife. Guys, if you were newly married today, would you change your last name, Ogie? Well, I don't, I, I'm an equality guy, Jim, but I mean, I don't know a single person, nor have I ever heard of a man changing his name to so his So you would wife. not change over I, No, I mean. I no. actually have a friend All who right. changed his last name to his you wife. Oh, what about you, Dave? I, I would not do it, but I, I might hyphenate. What's Elizabeth's maiden name? Uh, Carlisle. Carlisle, so you would not be Dave Carlisle. Yeah. Keith, would you change your name to your wife's name if you were married today, if you got married today? Yeah, Keith Granberry Shopshire, yeah, absolutely. You don't mind that? You have a hyphenated? Not really. I did not know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I would. I would change my name. I would. I really would. Okay. I, I well, would. We, we, we hope I, you I'm do. securing myself. Yeah. We, I'm secure. Yeah, we're going to secure uh, you somewhere. <laughs> uh, well, that's all the time. That's all the time we have. Oh, except for this. Uh, based on a recent uh, Ancestor-type report, Taylor Swift now finds out she's directly related to the 19th century poet Emily Dickinson. And, and really identifies with Emily Dickinson, who, as you may know, whose only one true love was another woman. Uh-oh, said Travis Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> For all of us here, try today. I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you next week.